Morning, everyone. We're running a, a few minutes late just because it's 9 a.m. on Saturday. Um, my apologies. But I think we should probably start. It's 9.10. Welcome. I'm extremely sorry for waking you up and bringing you out here at 9 in the morning on a weekend. Uh, I apologize, and I only hope that everything we say is going to justify your trip here. Uh, my name is Achal Prabhala. I'm a fellow of the Shuttleworth Foundation. I work on access to medicines uh, and run a short-term limited project to work on access to medicines in India, Brazil, and South Africa. It's called Access IBSA. Uh, very lucky to be here with my colleagues, um, as well as two external commentators whose work we follow and admire. I'll introduce each one of us as we go along. Um, and what we'll do is, Marcella, start with you. Is your presentation loaded up? Uh, Marcella Vieira is a lawyer and researcher who's been working on human rights and access to medicines uh, since 2005. Her specialization is intellectual property. Marcella is from Brazil, uh, where she's worked on uh, numerous strategies to advance uh, legal frameworks to make access to medicines in Brazil a reality. She's worked with ABIA, with GTPI, uh, many of the largest AIDS activists, uh, access to medicines groups working in the country, um, especially on intellectual property problems and reform. Marcella? So thank you. Thank you, Ashal, for the introduction. Uh, thanks, everyone, for... Uh, is it on? Oh, just one other note before you start, Marcella. Um, we have uh, three presentations from Marcella Vieira, from Andrew Renz, and Feroz Ali. And then we'll have a short discussion with Marumo Nkomo and Amy Kapczynski, our commentators. Uh, and then open up uh, the floor for discussion across the room. So, Marcella, Andrew, and Feroz, uh, as discussed, I have to speak uh, will <laughs> present for about 20 minutes. Okay, so help me keep track of time. And I'll please. bang the table. Where okay, <laughs> because this is a huge project that we are developing, so I try to uh, bring the, well, the biggest highlights, but I might get lost in some details, so please try to help me to keep track of time. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the part of the Excess IPSA project that we've been developing in Brazil. Uh, it's a, in a partnership with uh, Fiocruz, Fundação Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, and the Escola de Saúde Pública, uh, ENSPI. So we have been um, looking at the medicines that are bought under exclusivity by the Ministry of Health in Brazil, and we did an analysis of the patent situation and of the public procurement situation. So uh, Gabriela Costa Chavez, that many of you know, is the coordinator of the research. Unfortunately, she could not uh, join us today, so I will be uh, presenting on behalf of the whole research team. Uh, other than myself and Gabriela, we also had um, two other uh, pharmacists uh, working with us in the project. So basically, the main objectives um, number one was to try to contribute to a better understanding of the context in which public procurement of medicines occur in Brazil. And we had as focus the medicines that are purchased without public tendering. So, well, basically, Brazil has a universal public health system. So the public sector is the main buyer and the main supplier of medicines in Brazil. There's also lots of purchases that happens outside of the public sector, but the more expensive ones, they are mostly bought almost with uh, exclusivity by the public sector. So we looked at uh, HIV drugs, we look at the medicine, cancer medicines, and also in the medicines that we call of high complexity, because the pharmaceutical uh, assistance in Brazil has many components. And then in that high complexity ones, we find medicines for hepatitis C, hepatitis B, medicines for uh, 
where diseases, well, there's a whole range of diseases that are covered by these medicines. So basically what we try to do is identify out of this initial selection of medicines, which one were, uh, had only one supplier in the Brazilian market, and we call that a situation of exclusivity. And then we try to uh, investigate what were the determinants that were leading to that situation of exclusivity. So our focus was the patent system, uh, but we also talk a little bit about the uh, mechanisms of public purchases and also the uh, registration uh, part because along the research we could see that uh, there were lots of things that were uh, leading to the, the situation of, of exclusivity that were not directly related to the patent system. And then we try to identify uh, what are the available policy options and to make recommendations to improve the processes related to the situation and to bring uh, estimated of potential uh, savings for the public sector if they adopt uh, these, policy, uh, these other policy options that are available for them. Uh, so basically we are working four axes of analysis. One first identifying which are those medicines that only had one, one supply. Next one identifying the patent situation in Brazil of those medicines. Uh, the third one, looking at the public purchases, what was going on on the ground, how was these medicines being bought, who was bu buying what. And we also try to analyze some of the legal aspects that might be contributing to the situation. So basically we looked at, uh, we had as time frame, the situation in December 2016. So this is one of the limitations of the project is that lots of things already evolved from the situation that we had in December 2016 but uh, we, we had this uh, as time frame. So basically we looked at 170 active ingredients. Uh, we didn't break down by, because there are different presentations of each of these active ingredients. And then we found that uh, 77 of them had only one supplier in the Brazilian market. So that's about 45%. And then out of those 77, we decided to look at uh, the patent status to see what uh, if the, the situation of exclusivity could be explained by their patent situation. Uh, we saw that out of those 77, thir uh, three were already being produced by Brazilian generic manufacturers. So we ruled them out as having a patent barrier. So we only uh, looked at the patent status of 74 of, of the active ingredients. Uh, out of those, 54 are chemicals, small molecules, and 20 are biologics, the macromolecules. Uh, we found 170, uh, uh, 720 patent applications in Brazil related to 68 of those active ingredients. Um, we also find lots of patent applications at the international level that does not have a correspondent in Brazil. And we also decided to make that information public because sometimes, I mean, if it has been uh, protected by a patent or if there has been a patent application in other countries and that specific application was not filed in Brazil, we can consider that the context in, in, is in public domain. So we thought that there was uh, a relevant information should be published as well. And we found, well, basically an average of seven patent applications for each of the chemicals, uh, pharmaceutical ingredients, and 17 for the biologics. Uh, so, well, people in the room that work uh, with a uh, patent search knows that it's uh, always very challenging to try to identify which patents cover each medicines. I won't have the time to go into details on that, but I mean, just show, um, say that probably our patent mapping is not completely uh, full. We can have missed uh, some applications. So in terms of the, after we, after we identify those patent applications, we did an analysis of the content of each application. And in, these, in the first analysis that we did, we excluded 80 patent applications because it was, um, they were considered not to be directly linked to the pharmaceutical ingredients that we were 
uh, working with. We also decided to publish that information, uh, specifically uh, numbering this HE because if we identify it uh, linked to one pharmaceutical ingredient, it's probably that other people working uh, on patent search will also uh, come up with this, uh, with this number. And we think it's important information to see that someone analyzed it and thought that it was not relevant for that specific uh, active ingredient. So we ended up with 640 patent applications in Brazil related to 65 of the active ingredients that we work with. And then uh, we wanted to see their patent status as of December 2016 in the patent office. And we found that out of those, only 36 had been granted, eight had already expired, 353 were still pending a uh, decision by the patent office. So Brazil is one of the countries that has the biggest backlog of patent analysis in the world, in the pharmaceutical area. Now they are thinking about 13 years between the filing dates and the decision by the patent office. So that's why we have a huge number of, of applications that are still pending. Uh, 67 had already been rejected by the patent office. 171 was abandoned before there was any analysis and five of those were abandoned after the patent had been granted. Uh, so we divided uh, the group of medicines in four big groups uh, in order to help us to do the policy recommendations after. So group one is no patent identified in Brazil. So we consider those are having no patent barriers. Those are nine active ingredients. Uh, group two is those that uh, have that we did identify some patent applications, but they were either abandoned, rejected, or expired. So there was no uh, patent uh, in force for those that were six. Uh, those that only had pending patent applications, those are 31 active ingredients. And uh, 28 actually have uh, granted patents. So we focus our analysis in the 31 that have only pending patent applications what we can do to uh, increase access to those, and also what are the policy options regarding the ones that actually had patent granted. So, well, for those who are interested in knowing the, which are the active ingredients that we've been working on, here are the names. I can't go through all of them now, but uh, it's available. It's going to be available soon, the full reports. So I don't have much time. I have five minutes and I'll have to rush. Okay, so also just to say that we also afterwards, as a second step of the patent analysis was to classify them as primary and secondary patent applications. And then of course we found that most of the patent applications was secondary patent applications. We had a little bit of trouble trying to use this primary secondary for the biological uh, products, the literature is not very clear on how we can classify those, those products in those terms. So it's also a contribution to the field. So the literature for chemicals, it's very well established, but there's not much established for the biologics. Uh, and a third step, after classifying them as primary or secondary, we also looked to see if they were covering the, produ the product or only the process because we classify it as primary if it covers the process of synthesis of the pharmaceutical ingredient. Uh, and then, well, we saw that uh, most of the, lots of the, of the medicines that had the granted patents had product patents, but there were some that only had uh, process uh, patents that were protecting them. Uh, and then we came up with these schema, I'm sorry, it's only in Portuguese for now, it has not been translated yet, but basically what are the policy, I mean, the risk assessments that we can do according to each of these group situations. So basically we consider that if there is, uh, if the status shows only uh, abandoned, rejected, or expired uh, applications, then there is no risk. If uh, there is a, a, a patent that is pending, then we have to, it can be a uh, risk one, we classified it, because as we are going to see in the legal aspects, one of the legal things that are the, the depositants can file for damages if the patent gets granted afterwards, even for, for 
things that happened before the patent was granted, so that increases the liability. And then we consider only risk two when there is a patent that uh, covers the, the product itself. So here are the figures in terms of public procurement. I don't have time to go into this, but we can see that in the year 2016, the ones that took uh, the highest uh, expenditures of the Brazilian market. So, so Fosbovia, Dalimab, well, the ones that we are doing lots of uh, trastuzumab, ones that are very expensive uh, in many countries. So for those active ingredients that has no patent right here, uh, we try to make a price comparison, looking at the prices of generics or biosimilars available in the international market. Uh, I have to say that it has been very, very challenged to find prices of generics. So if any people on the ground has any thoughts about that, we would like to hear. Uh, especially because we are working with figures from 2016. So sometimes we can find figures of today, but to find historical data, it's, it's very, very, very difficult. So I just put some examples regarding um, hepatitis C medicine and ARV medicines because they are the easiest to find the information available. So for instance, for Sofosbovir, in one year, if we bought the generic instead of buying the price of Gilead, we could have savings of about 135 uh, million US dollars. That's considering the volumes of 2016, it has increased. So that, has, that would be even more if we consider um, volumes of today. I only have one minute, so I don't really have much time to go to the legal aspects. But as I said, we looked at the pending patent applications and the liability for, um, for acts committed during the pending time. And then we thought we found that the Brazilian legislation is actually much more uh, trips plus and much more strong in terms of the guarantees that it gives for the for the patent ap applicant than many other countries. We also looked for uh, well, sometimes the exclusivity situation was not actually being caused by the patent status, but it was being caused by the fact that there was uh, only one uh, company that had. Uh, sanitary registration in Brazil. So even in the absence of patent barrier, that happened a lot. And then that was not the focus of our project, but uh, we found that we really need to do more work on understanding what are the options when there is no patent barrier, but there is no uh, market, uh, there is no sanitary registration. Because in Brazil, you have to have a sanitary registration in your visa if you want to sell it in the Brazilian market. So basically this synthesizes what are the options that we can uh, have to face the patent barrier and also to try to increase uh, access to the medicines when there is no patent barrier. One thing that we think that the Brazilian uh, government could be doing uh, more proactively is to try to identify sources of generic producers in the international markets and invite them to register in Brazil. That's something that's totally not happening. Uh, and that's one thing that we, we think can be done more. And of course, using more the cheap sensibilities for those cases where there is actually a patent uh, granted and trying to increase the measures that have already been uh, taking place to try to reduce the time of, of the analysis by the patent office, uh, especially filing for uh, prioritary examination requests for those that are actually very relevant for the public health system. So there are lots of alternatives. I, sorry, I think my time is up, so I will end here and we can have more discussions. Absolutely, the and there'll be lots thank of opportunity you. to discuss this further in the questions, but thank you, Marcella. Uh, I'll call upon Andrew Renz, uh, and while Andrew Renz heads up, um, the basis of the work that Marcella was describing is uh, uh, on, the, on the basis of uh, extensive discussions where we, we tried to figure out what was missing in the research scenario in order to compel governments to take patent reform seriously. And, and one of those things in Brazil was this excellently functioning, relatively uh, well-funded in another economy, uh, public health system in which uh, very expensive cancer medications, very expensive hepatitis C medications in a country with high prevalence uh, were being provided in the public health system. And, and one of uh, the things that we found very compelling was to be able to present the case for access to medicines as instead uh, a way by which the government public health program could do 10 or 20 times more with the same uh, budgetary outlay on uh, medicines. 
this is one part of the work that they're doing. Um, there's much more, and it's on accessipsa.org. Uh, but Andrew, Andrew uh, works on problems at the intersection of law and technology, including health innovation, artificial intelligence and development, and open educational resources. Uh, Andrew was the first ever Shuttleworth Fellow uh, and uh, is from South Africa. He has a PhD from Duke University and is currently running a research program on uh, governance of the Internet of Things at the Internet Governance Lab right here at American University. Welcome, Andrew. So, um, thank you very much. Um, I talk, so, I'm going to move it along um, as quickly as I can learn how to use this machine. Yes, Max. Right, so this is just a reminder. Why are we, why are we concerned about patents in South Africa? <clears throat> These aren't my slides, I, I found pretty good um, graphics for the current situation in South Africa, the n sort of percentage of the population, and comparatively to the rest of the world, people suffering from HIV in Southern Africa. This is TB deaths related to people with HIV. Again, South Africa and Southern Africa suffers disproportionately. This is HIV death rates. Again, South Africa suffers disproportionately. And this is HIV expenditure, and South Africa is spending a lot of money on HIV. Um, so maybe I just wanted that reminder because what I'm going to speak about is a little dry. What does the patent data tell us? What does patent metadata tell us about innovation by South Africans using the patent system. And we start with this curious question, what's the purpose of the patent system in South Africa? And this, surprisingly, there's not a lot of consensus amongst those who are pro-patent in South Africa. This is uh, Dr. Sadullah Kajikar. He's at the University of Stellenbosch. And this is what he has to say. The intangible nature of intellectual property, such as copyright or patents, makes it necessary to provide legal protection. Because society is enriched by innovative projects and works of literature, art, or music, it is considered socially beneficial to incentivize, his word, not mine, I don't think it's a good word, <laughs> the creation of these things. While there may be many reasons why people create things that may be protected by, protectable by intellectual property law, the recognition of property rights is a powerful device it serves as an incentive for marginal innovation which yields socially beneficial creations. So he holds an important chair at a, a, an important university in South Africa, the University of Stellenbosch. But it seems that others who are um, part of the um, intellectual property establishment in South Africa don't think he's right. This is Dr. Tim Burrell. He's a, um, that, that doctorate for writing the, the leading text on patents in South Africa. I think he was actually instrumental in the, this bringing about the 78 Act, and this is what he has to say. South Africa's patent system is not designed to encourage innovation. It never has been. Patent represents a quid pro quo. The quid is a monopoly conferred on the patentee for a number of years. The quo is the new knowledge which he or she represents to the public. It is a deal between the inventor and the state. The Patent Act is to provide a legal framework for innovative disclosure in exchange for reward. The patent system is not designed to encourage innovation. This is Doc, uh, Dr. Pearl. So this is Alison Dyer. She's a patent practitioner, but also co-author with um, a, a yet another um, academic, uh, Owen Dean, of, of a book on intellectual property in South Africa. She says, patent protection is important, but it's not, sorry, there's a not missing there. It's not the only plank in the platform supporting innovation and local innovation in particular. So while it has, has to be there, it is not going to be a driving factor. So we seem amongst, amongst those in South Africa who are pro-patent, there seems to be a strange disagreement about exactly what the patent system is for. But because um, when, when it's been suggested that South Africa should reform its patent system, um, there's been a, a, a number of claims in the press, quite uh, 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 strong claims, that um, patents result in innovation in South Africa already, and that to tinker with the system will reduce South African innovation. So what we wanted to do was look at the patent data, that, particularly the metadata, and see if we could see any evidence of patents uh, creating incentives for innovation. There's a curious thing. Dr. Burrell said, 
we give the monopoly in, in response to the disclosure of information. But he never explained how this could work in a jurisdiction in which patents are not examined. OK, so for those of you who missed that, patents are not examined in South Africa. You pay the fee, you fill the form in. Actually, you pay a lawyer to fill the form in, a particular kind of lawyer. And then you get a patent. As long as the forms are filled in correctly, the diagrams are correct, and the fee is paid, you get a patent. So we give our monopolies for nothing. So whenever that happens, we should ask ourselves, qui bono, who benefits? I'll, I'll let you think about that question as we go through the data. So we, we looked at a large data set um, from January 2005 to July 2015. It was a static data set. We were unable to work with the online um, metadata provided by the Southern um, Patent Office. It's called the Commission on, for Companies and Intellectual Property. Um, and what we found, so we very helpfully got some data from BTI, so thanks, thank you, Maruma, um, that uh, in that patent set, the vast majority, so close to 90%, were foreign patents. These are patents registered by foreign patent holders, almost all of which had been registered elsewhere first. So South African innovation is not the main use of the patent office. So who are South African patentees? So we, we found that um, in individuals is the largest number, but uh, companies is the close second. Universities um, and research organizations, universities have registered a lot more patents, but research organizations, and those are state research organizations. The CSIR, South Africa has an equivalent CSRI to India. It's a state state organization. Uh, this mention of closed corporations, that's just a type of um, SME, small company um, that can only have natural people holding it. So we knew that all, all of those were, were South African. So OK, so we see individuals and companies both making use of the system. So in which fields do South Africans patent? So here, I don't know if this is that, um, that visible to you. So I'm going to read it. As, you'll, uh, as you may all know, the um, World Intellectual Property Organization has patent classifications, which have a code. So here we say the biggest number of South African patents, the, the classification that is most common to, to a number of patents is only 4.7%, and it's E21D, which is shafts, tunnels, gal galleries, large underground chambers. In other words, these patents have to do with mining, and they have to do with the extractive phase of mining. They're not high value. Number two is, for some reason, containers for storage of transport articles and materials. I don't have a good explanation for why that is. The third down at 3%. So there's no blockbuster category yet, right? 4.7 is our biggest category, is electrical digital data processing. And then the classification for medicines, A61K, and this includes um, Pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical preparations, but it also includes home remedies and it includes basically toiletries. It will include things like a, a face cream. Ooh. All right, so no blockbuster category. What about the foreign patents? Well, there we have a, a large category. 17.27% is A61K, pharmaceuticals. Next category down, heterocyclic compounds, includes chemicals which are important in pharmaceuticals. Next category, which is quite a lot smaller, 3.52, is uh, things like pesticides and herbicides. So we see that South African patents don't, aren't, aren't highly technical. So the, the main thing you get in shafts and, uh, and, and, and tunnels, et cetera, is something called a rock bolt. Anybody interested? I'll tell you about that afterwards. Does the patent system benefit women in South Africa? So this is based. Um, this slide is based on um, me classifying whether the, the data is not collected by the, the patent office. Me classifying, reading who the inventors were, and guessing whether they were women based on their names. So it's probably approximately right. I doubt I overcounted the woman. I'm, I, I doubt I undercounted the woman. But if so, it was probably not by a large percentage. And let's see. Universities, well, uh, 41% of the patentees from uh, the inventors from universities 
were women, but it drops dramatically, um, and we can see that women aren't really doing much innovation because of this patent incentive, or quid pro quo, if you believe Dr. Burrell. So whose patents are valuable outside South Africa? So who of those groups, companies, et cetera, bothers to patent outside South Africa? And we'll see it's pretty much the universities, um, um, of the 246 patents that universities got, they chose to get 149 of them outside South Africa. So that's the highest percentage. Whereas for individuals, lots of patents in South Africa, almost none outside. So, in other words, they didn't think these patents were particularly valuable because they weren't willing to go through an examination system. If they could get the patent without examination as an individual, then they would. Same thing for companies. So, what that suggests is the patents weren't, that, that most of the South African patents aren't particularly valuable. South Africa is a small market. If you really want to make money, you're going to have to patent elsewhere. And that the people are choosing not to suggests that those are not very innovative patents. All right, there's a number of problems with the 1978 Act. This is section 34. It says the exam registrar shall examine in the prescribed manner every application for patent and see if it complies with the requirements of the Act. So we should have examination, right? But we don't because the regulations say all the registrar has to check, do is check if they he, um, the patent prescribes with the formalities of the Act, not substantively. These are the proceedings you can bring under the Patent Act. Um, you can correct things. You can restore the patent if it gets, um, uh, if you fail to pay your fee, basically. You can, um, you can amend your patent, and you can apply for compulsory license. Amending your patent um, is basically a tactic you can engage in if you get sued. So or if you sue someone and they claim that your patent's not valid as a defense, then you can simply amend your patent um, in a way that will then prevent the, the other side succeeding. So it allows you to um, use a very cheap mechanism to defeat the claim of, of somebody coming against you in expensive litigation. So is South African patent law stacked in the patentee's favor? Well, firstly, we give the patent without examination. Then we place the onus on the person trying to revoke it. Now, it might be legitimate to place the onus on the person trying to revoke it where there's examination. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense in, um, in a situation where you haven't had to meet any burden to get the patent. We, um, I see Microsoft's done bad things to my slide. Um, if you don't, lit we're in litigation, if you're sued by a patentee, if you don't plead that the patent is invalid, um, but you, you succeed with some other defense, um, but that defense effectively shows the patent is, it shouldn't have been granted, the patent will remain in force. Um, and, and you can amend. If you're the patentee, you can amend during litigation and thus defeat the other side who've brought this expensive litigation against you um, all right. Okay. So I'm going to briefly speak about, I'm not going to speak about res, um, the research process. Anybody wants to know about um, the, what we went through to clean the data and make sense of it? You can speak to me afterwards or perhaps in the questions. What does reform require? Examination, pre-grant opposition, post-grant opposition, patent criteria to prevent evergreening and improve process for compulsory licensing. So um, in conclusion, South Africa currently has a system which our data shows does not, it appears Professor Burrell is right. The South African patent system is not designed to and doesn't accidentally produce South African innovation. But um, our law then makes it very difficult to revoke the, the non-examined patents that we grant. And so we give easily, make it very hard to take away. That's it. Thank you very much, Andrew.
Andrew was spared from a, a vigorous debate on this very paper in Johannesburg, uh, an event uh, organized by the Department of Trade and Industry uh, by Marumo, uh, where I stood in for Andrew. Uh, oh, so uh, and if you want to see okay. uh, two uh, innocent researchers getting beaten up by <laughs> stalwarts of the South African patent system, then you can head over to accessipsa.org. Uh, Firoz, Firoz Ali yep. is next up. Uh, Firoz Ali is the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion uh, in the Ministry of Commerce and Industry Chair on Intellectual Property Rights. It used to be the Ministry of Human Resources Chair in Intellectual Property Rights. This is considerably more difficult to say, uh, but it's just as prestigious. He holds one of the most uh, prestigious named chairs in intellectual property at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, which is among uh, the most prestigious institutions of higher learning in India. Uh, he's also a practicing advocate at the Madras High Court and has had a long-standing interest in intellectual property uh, and matters of public concern in India. Welcome, Firoz. Yeah, thanks, Rachan. I'll start with uh, Andrew's last slide. Now, this was what South Africa wanted, right? Uh, examination, pre-grant, post-grant, patent criteria for preventing evergreening and improved process for competitive licensing. India has everything. So we set out to see how it worked in practice. So my entire research, which I've been doing with Archil uh, and which has been funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation is to see how this great so-called Indian example, which is the, you know, the, the, uh, the pharmacy of the developing world, how a country which has all this wannabe so-called flexibilities that people are talking about, which had it from day one to start with post trips, how did that work? So now I come to my presentation. So we just set out doing that. <clears throat> yep. Yep. Uh, so, so we set out doing that, and um, many of the people in this room have done some substantial work on how the Indian example has worked at the initial level. I mean, soon after trips, and we had the Novartis case. There's quite a lot of literature that has been covered. I happen to do my doctoral thesis in Duke on that, and I'm happy to note that Professor Reichman and Dr. So, who have been my doctoral thesis board, they are here right now. So India went through this process of taking the transition period, the 10-year period, and we brought in three amendments, and so the compliance with TRIPS was on a phased manner, and you can note that as India was doing these compliant changes to be in tune with TRIPS, there were also certain reactive changes that India was doing. For instance, they had introduced a higher standard of patentability, a new form of opposition, a more robust compulsory licensing regime. So while it was complying, India was also tweaking with certain reactive changes. So this uh, we needed to know how this had worked. And India, for one, has a substantial patent examination system, and we have the TRIPS-approved criteria for patentability. We have a, probably the longest list of exceptions, and we had a talk on limitations and exceptions yesterday. Uh, it looks like some kind of exception taken out of a copyright law. We have 15 exceptions to patentability. And the grounds of revocation are even more. So. How this has worked out in practice, and it, so we set out looking at the practice of patent office because that's the first line of defense, how the patent office is operating. And we found that we had certain advantages in looking at uh, the patent office because the patent office in India, when it has to reject a patent application, it has to give a decision under a particular provision in law, and that has to be a recent decision. So we had the set of recent decisions to look at so the first thing we did was even before looking at the grant pattern or looking at whether India is granting the right patents and the flexibilities have been used to check the grant of the patents, we set out looking at how India first rejected patents. So this we uh, th there are three reports that we have done so far. So the last report is still a work in progress. The first report was on how India rejects patents. And the second one was to take the lessons from the reject and to see whether India has been, the Indian Patent Office has been applying the same standard when it comes to granting patents. So the provisions that are relevant where the, what is the famed section 3D, which I've just reproduced here, I will not take you through that. And we also have a 3E exception, which prevents 
granting patterns on mere admixtures. So 3D and 3E in combination, you'll see that they work pretty well. And we also have some certain absolute exceptions, like second medical use is not granted patterns in India. And apart from this, we also have the plants and animals exceptions, you know, varieties, seeds, and parts of plants and animals cannot be patented. That is right now, uh, before the Supreme Court, Monsanto has taken an appeal. Monsanto lost its patent because the Delhi uh, division bench of the Indian uh, High Court, Delhi High Court said that they cannot have a patent under the Patents Act. They can only go under the Plant Varieties Act. So uh, the list is exhaustive, but we are just confined to a few anti-evergreening provisions here. So, so this is the first report that we came up with. And we found that predominantly the patent office does its job on its own. So 95% of the samples that we studied were rejected by the patent office without the intervention of a third party, a pre-grant opponent. So though we had pre-grant opponent, a position in our law, uh, only few of them were active. And in fact, we have, I don't think we have more than 500 decisions for on pre-grant opposition in the country. So only a very small percentile uh, was instrumental. This is largely because of the way in which the patent prosecution is set up. The patent office looks into pre-grant only when it takes a call that it has to grant the patent. So the pre-grant is not looked into till the patent office makes its mind on whether to grant a patent or not. So obviously, the pre-grant comes in only after the patent office does its check. That probably explains the smaller amount of successful pre-grant oppositions. And in looking at the rejects, we found that this is how the number operated. There are very few pre-grant oppositions. And we also looked at the trend between pharma and non-pharma. And I, I, I know it's red and light brown. And we found that the there is a there, there is an increasing trend in rejecting pharma, which shoots up. You can see that after 2012, 2013, uh, and it, it shoots up. And the reason is that the no artist judgment comes around that time. And the no artist judgment kind of gave an approval to the patent office what it has been doing. The no artist rejection was by way of a pre-grant opposition, and that was the first reject on 3D. So that happened somewhere in 2007. So it took nearly six or seven years for the law to be settled on that. So after no artists, you find that the patent office has been using the 3D and the other exceptions more robustly. And this is how the grounds of rejections map. 3D in itself is effective, but 3D works better when it's used in conjunction with other exceptions like 3I, which is on method of treatment, and 3E, which is on, uh, on admixtures. Now this is the, how the other grounds have worked. Like in most patent offices, the grounds, the tests of patentability become the novelty and inventor step. They are the main grounds on which applications get rejected, followed by other um, grounds, like section three is, there's a substantial contribution on section three as well. Now, what does it mean? A couple of things which we noticed is that 3D works better in combination with other grounds than in isolation. Then uh, 3D also incorporates a kind of a comparative yardstick. Now, we know that uh, in, in, in proving either novelty or lack of novelty of, or lack of inventive step, you need to compare it with the prior art. And in India, we did a small re-engineering on this definition of inventive step. Uh, we also brought in this aspect of technical advancement from what is already known. So whenever you are making a comparison, be it a prior art comparison or a 3D kind of comparison, you have to bring this comparative yardstick and prove that you've done something better than what's already there. So we found that applicants were finding it hard to prove that enhanced efficacy, just how they were finding it difficult to prove technical advancement because it required some data to be pr produced before the patent system. And, uh, and, and it also tells us that 3D is something which works much better when there is a support system. For instance, there's a provision in the Patents Act which obliges the applicant to disclose foreign filed applications which can tell the patent office on how applications filed by the same applicant has fared in other jurisdictions. And we have an, as I said, we have an enhanced or a heightened patentability standard, which involves a comparison, which kind of increases the disclosure standard an applicant has to make. Uh, traditionally, you file an application in the US and you just enter India. But when you enter, you need to ensure that the disclosure is actually tuned specifically towards certain laws in the country. So that was the first report. Then we moved on to our second report, which is to take 
the lessons that we learned on how the patent office rejected, and we tried to use that to see whether pat the patent office does its job in following the standards it has set. So this was the uh, patent uh, grant report, and, and as the title says, how our safeguards against evergreening have failed and why the system might be reformed. Now, there was some impact, some tangible impact. I mean, we loaded this report, and for the next 24 hours, the site crashed. So we know that there's some, uh, we, and, and I hear from uh, uh, from some friends in the um, in the civil society that there was some kind of a co committee constituted to look into this. But as you know, things do take time. So the objective here, yeah, the objective here was to look at the grants in the Indian Patent Office in contravention to the anti evergreening provisions. So uh, we took a fairly big sample. And, and we had seen how this could be analyzed. Now, there are two broad ways we did that. One, we tried to incorporate the findings from our earlier report. Are the grants on the same grounds? We looked at FER, the first examination uh, report, and see whether they were upheld. We also had a smaller set where we looked at the written opinions. Sometimes when the controller raises an objection that a patent cannot be granted and the applicant gets over it, there has to be a written order. So we had a smaller set of written orders. So we'll just take you through that. So um, predominantly, we, were, we could see that there were secondary patents that have been granted by the patent office. In, 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 when you compare it with the primary patents, it's, it, it's, the numbers are quite uh, small. And the, we have a very detailed methodology. The, and the entire data which we used has been put up on the uh, Excel sheets are there on the Access IPSA website. Uh, so we, we also found that uh, secondary patents were granted on actually the 3D categories. Now, uh, 3D includes, should take, should ideally catch formulations, physical variants, salts, esters, ether, products, and I, uh, isomers, but that formed 78%. Now, formulations is quite a broad thing. You can't say that every formulation could technically fall under 3D, but Given the fact that some of these applications had an earlier parent and the fact that they were coming down the line, we could classify them as secondary applications. And, and this is how the formulations, combinations are all compared to. Now, we had the benefit of looking into the Novartis case and, and we developed an argument that the Novartis case actually puts forward a Novartis standard what we call the no water standard, which actually tells how these applications have to be uh, have to be dealt with. So you saw the spike in the earlier report that some controllers were applying the no water's decision to say that, hey, no, this is the law, this is the reason we are rejecting it. But in this report, we also found that despite there being this no water standard, the standards were not captured in the right manner in the examination guidelines. And probably because of that, we found that there were secondary patents being granted despite the standard being very clear. Now, the standard involves identifying the new form, comparing it with, I mean, it's a seven-step standard. I mean, we have just provided that. I'll just quickly take you through this. But we looked into a smaller number of cases, 50 cases, post Novartis, where this standard was not followed. So we, we report that the detailed analysis of the prosecution history of 50 cases revealed in none of these cases has the applicant satisfactorily surmounted the barriers set by the Novartis case or surmounted the threshold set by the IPO's earlier decision. So we found that there were 50 cases which didn't comply with the standard. Now, they are essentially cases where the examiners has raised anti-evergreening provisions in the examination report, but it did not translate into a grant. Now, the report has been there more than six, uh, 10 months now, I mean, close to 10 months, and uh, we have not seen any substantial action around it, but we are hoping that there could be some uh, litigation action to, you know, just test this further. Now, so we report that there is a very high error rate at the patent office, and the fact that, uh, that the anti-evergreening provisions have not been applied uniformly to reap the benefits. So a couple of things that we suggest is to update the guidelines which we have in our country and to have the NOATA standard very clearly uh, introduced into it and to have an anti-evergreening checklist for the examiners, which is not there in, uh, it's there, it's not there right now in the country. And also to 
make the 3D exception an absolute exception, like, like how the Argentinian uh, uh, examination guidelines are. Make it absolute, don't make it something which people can get over. Now, we also have some work on biologics, and we are looking at a similar pattern on rejects and grants. And it's to look at how the Indian Patent Office has been dealing with biologics. Uh, 3D technically should not fall to protect or to ensure that you know there can be some kind of uh, screening of biologics. But we still see that some controllers have been using 3D to raise objections on biologics. So it's an ongoing study. We are just uh, it, we are choosing a small sample uh, to do this, and we may extend this to you know fit in more drug candidates. And and it's still a work in progress. So the initial report is that uh, of the patent office does not have a biologic classification. So we had to look at different streams, biotechnology, microbiology, biochemistry, and then what is generally called biological inventions. Then we had to look at certain quotes and bring it down. And we found that, we found that the, the grant and the rejects are kind of close to each other, but this does not give the full picture because the grants are only with regard to, we, here we have only studied the grants which have a, a written decision. So uh, I'll just conclude now, uh, again, the. Incidence of opposition is very low, especially in biologics. It's even worse than what it was for uh, for the bigger molecule, small molecules in pharmaceuticals. And, and we had categorized the types of biologics. Proteins become the most dominant category here. And the grounds of rejections are similar. You know, the, pa the invent patentability tests are the most often used grounds. Then you have the statutory exceptions to patentability. And written description. Written description is interesting because uh, we have a host of abandonments whenever the Patent Office raises a ground on written description. That's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Firoz. Uh, what we're going to do is, Amy, will you come back up? Um, uh, I'm going to lead a, a small discussion with our commentators, Maruma Nkomo and Amy Kopchinski, uh, and I'll begin by introducing them, uh, followed by which we'll have a broader discussion. Uh, so you'll have lots of time to ask questions. Uh, Marcella, if you want to join us here, you're welcome. Or later, as you wish. Uh, Maruma Nkomo is uh, a director at the division, which is named International Trade and Economic Development at the Department of Trade and Industry uh, at the Government of South Africa. Uh, Marumo is uh, the rare civil servant who, who comes to this position with extensive experience in academia, um, as well as industry. He worked um, uh, at the University of Cape Town and uh, at a leading intellectual property law firm in South Africa. Amy Kopchinski is a professor of law at Yale Law School, um, uh, is a co-founder of uh, UAEM, uh, Universities Allied for Essential Medicines, um, and, and someone who's been writing extensively and working extensively in this area. Um, I have a few questions for both of you, and uh, uh, I'll start off by asking a question to Amy, uh, but Amy, do please use that to expand on anything that you found interesting um, in what you just heard. Uh, one of the uh, conclusions from our research in India uh, is that we have absolute exceptions and conditional exceptions uh, uh, to prevent evergreening. And it does seem like the conditional exceptions were written in as a way to make the exception seem less threatening uh, than it was if it was phased in blanket terms. Uh, and when you look at a provision like uh, the standard for increased uh, therapeutic efficacy, our research shows that it's never been satisfied. There have been cases where it's been erroneously accepted by the patent office as satisfactory, but the standard, in fact, hasn't been satisfied. And one of our uh, conclusions and recommendations is that either in the patent examination guidelines or in a possible future amendment, uh, the, the condition uh, is insufficient on many grounds. It causes complexity and confusion when examining and, and creates an opportunity for diversionary exchanges. Uh, and uh, given that it's never been satisfied, our recommendations were to move what we have, our anti-evergreening provisions, up one notch. That, of course, then gets into the question of TRIPS compatibility, of you know, whether those provisions will run into trouble with the WTO. What, what are your general thoughts on, 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 on where that could go? Um, thanks. First of all, I, I just wanted to say um, how impressive this body of work is and um, how, uh, how much I've learned from, from reading the various reports. Um, and 
um, I think it, it really does create a, a very strong basis for now talking about concrete reforms. And so most of my thoughts as I'm listening are about the kinds of reforms that help both on the substantive side and also then to make an office that actually functions well, uh, which is obviously a big challenge. Um, uh, so with respect to the, 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 the point about 3D, um, I mean, I, I think there's a strong case that there's no problem with uh, rev revisions of the sort that you're talking about to make these exclusions more categorical, more manageable um, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, one being that, um, you know, countries face different kinds of administrative challenges and so making a system that's simple so that it can be administered, there should be no problem with making that um, a, a priority. In fact, it's a sensible priority. Um, and there's lots of ways in which, whether through guidelines or through statutes, uh, countries do, in fact, um, uh, define particular scope of patentability, particular ways that, say, obviousness standard applies to different kinds of subject matter and so forth. And I've always thought of 3D as, as, as plausibly a sort of specific application of the obviousness standard. Uh, and in fact, um, some of your analysis could show why, in fact, it, sh it could be extended in, under, under that theory or under others. So. I think it's, it's, it shouldn't be considered problematic. And the other feature of, of course, um, what countries face when they uh, have questions about what TRIPS means is that there's every reason uh, when there's a public health priority locally to, to, to take you the view that you think is appropriate and let someone challenge it, right? I mean, the, the way that, that, that challenges are brought is, has to be brought by another country and it has to be, only, and it's only prospective, the damages. And so I think it's, it's really important also to build a culture of, um, of, of willingness to assert your own uh, interpretations of the agreement and insist upon them, particularly where the stakes are as high as they are here. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Marumo, uh, uh, one of the uh, longstanding themes in copyright reform has been the, the inability of copyright legislations written in the late 90s or sometimes even in the early 2000s uh, to fully grapple with the internet. Uh, for instance, the copyright reform that's on the table now in South Africa, I think, has been attacked by both friends and foes alike as being inadequately responsive to, uh, to different means of, of sharing and mobilization enabled by uh, a, a sort of omnipresent internet. And I was wondering, in relation to that, uh, given that you are working on a fairly comprehensive patent law updation or reform in South Africa, how do you grapple with the role of uh, changing technology uh, in, uh, in the patent system? Because it seems like we, we talk a little less about that, uh, this idea that you have biologics, you have a whole host of other kinds of um, innovative medicines. And I guess part of the question is how do you think uh, given that you'll be uh, working on a new patent law in 2018 and 2019, um, how do you look at uh, frontier technologies that exist and possibly prepare for the ones uh, that don't exist? Thanks, uh, Achal, for the question. Maybe I'll also, if, if with your permission, Chair, I'd also maybe just want to add a little bit to what Prof. Amy just mentioned now. Um, around the issue of um, asserting your, 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 your interpretation uh, of TRIPS. Look, I think that is, is, is right and it's important, but you know, I'm here in my capacity as a, a civil servant, although I have an academic hat, but I'm, 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 I'm here in my uh, you know, capacity as a civil servant. And one of the realities that can't be underestimated um, is that you know, as people who um, are civil servants from developing countries, <coughs> there's, you may be right, but it doesn't mean that you can proceed with something, even if you're right. Uh, there's a lot of other considerations. You guys heard um, from, you know, for example, the US Chamber, um, you know, uh, on, I don't know, when was it? Um, on the opening on night? The yeah, yeah on, the, on, the, on the opening night. That's, uh, you know, I wasn't there, but I mean, um, from, 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 from what I'm told, you, you didn't even get even a glimpse or an insight as to the kind of um, dynamics that exist when you're dealing with a, a multitude of interests. Uh, so as governments, we, we always have to be very um, cognizant about that. Uh, I mean, um, so for instance, you will know that um, African countries, we benefit from a unilateral uh, preference extended by the United States government um, through the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Uh, it's unilateral. Um, we have what they call out of cycle reviews where your you know, regime can be, can be, can be reviewed and, and, and it's really, it's, 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 
you, you don't really have a lot of leverage. Um, so you really have to take all of, all of these things into consideration. So yes, you may be right, but um, you know, being right isn't always enough. Um, but um, when, when I would, so on, on this question, yeah, look, um, you're quite right. And, and I think that it's important that you must um, also take into consideration that so in, in South Africa, we've got the legislative reform. Then we also have got uh, another tier, which is the regulations, and we've got the substantive guidelines. So our hope is that uh, through having um, you know, uh, guidelines that are flexible, that allow us to um, take into consideration new research uh, as, as, a, as it develops, would be able then to uh, accommodate the trends and technology through the, you know, through the um, guidelines. What we want to have is legislation that gives us a broad mandate as the um, executive to be able then to, um, to cater for changes in technology, et cetera, through the, through the guidelines. Thank you, Marumo. Um, Amy, uh, uh, one question that I have for you is, uh, a lot of the work that we've done in India is uh, to, to look at the specific anti-evergreening provisions that we have encoded in our law. And, and use that to create a system which weeds out what we would think of as the junk, uh, uh, the secondary patents, um, and, and, and preserve, in some sense, uh, the legitimate patents. Uh, now, that brings us to an interesting question here in the United States, where you and others have been arguing for a greater role and a greater responsibility that uh, public institutions, both taxpayer-funded as well as publicly funded like universities, uh, should take in the accountability of the money that they contribute towards basic research that ends up in privatized medicine. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, I think both generally as uh, also especially in this particular era of U.S. government, how um, that responsibility translates in the United States, what the prospects are for that translating into some accountability for access to medicines in the States, but also whether there's a case to still be made about that access uh, and that responsibility extending across United States borders, because it seems like you can make a good case for U.S. taxpayer money to uh, benefit U.S. citizens. Uh, I, I'm not sure how that case extends to Indians. Um, well, I mean, I think um, one thing to say is that UAM as a group, for example, is still working um, with both of those things in mind, trying to get universities as, as, you know, kind of key participants in this process who have to make decisions about how they treat their intellectual property both at home and abroad, how they license it, where they seek it, is still working to sort of keep both of those conversations together and to insist that we do have a responsibility um, whether as sort of taxpayers or citizens to, to be accountable for our decisions, particularly where there's almost no reason to think that, you know, seeking patents in a country like India is going to have any real significant benefit even for the, in a sort of private sense, right, for the entities that, that just simply want um, to, to earn from royalties or sales, right. So, um, you know, the there is a very, very, um, you know, new and vibrant conversation in the U.S. now about what to do about high drug prices. And I think part of what's fascinating to me about that debate is how much it's been influenced by the international conversation, right? Many of the people who are most active in that debate, and some of them are in the room, um, Peter and others, come from and learned what they know about the impact of patents and access and the problems with um, uh, the current approach in um, the international access uh, community. And I come to those questions, and now I do do some work on the US stuff with everything I've learned from India, which is really where I learned about the problems with patent quality, <laughs> uh, where I spent my time actually looking through patents and, and trying to understand um, how it could be that you would offer patents on new uses of known substances or methods of treatment and so forth. And so I think it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful example of the importance of this transnational work. Um, uh, so, so are the prospects um, for more around the kind of return to the to the taxpayer for um, taxpayer funded research? I think everything depends on elections, as is always true. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure the same is true in India, right? So, everything turns on elections, and um, I do think there's now a, 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 there are many proposals on the table, which again people in this room have been involved in, um, that are new new legislative proposals. Um, by Democrats right, that would try to make more meaningful the ability to um, to um, control drug prices. And I think as part of that, although the legislative proposals for the most part don't address specifically consequences of public funding, that's in part because we have a system that could actually do that and I, that requires political will to go in and use either march-ins or, or, or the, um, 
the paid up royalties that exist uh, for federally funded research. Some of the work that, that I've done about uh, our compulsory licensing provision in the US, the um, section 1498 of our patent law, I've always thought um, is best used in fact in conjunction with, or sort of as some, uh, the most compelling case can, is in conjunction with publicly funded research that maybe has some additional of these secondary patents a, a, a alongside of it that might belong to private entities. Um, and, and I do think that um, certainly if we have a change of administration, and even before that, there will be continued efforts to get those those options on the table to be taken more seriously. And I hope that as part of that, of course, that there will be um, attention to how these rights are exerted abroad. Um, although, as you say, that's not, um, it's not always you know, sort of the most obvious argument, but I do think that, that things have changed from the days when, as Rob said yesterday, you know, you walk into the U.S. government and they say, well, we don't care about what happens elsewhere in the world. I mean, obviously, the Trump administration is a beast unto itself, but, um, but I think those, the, the movement has changed those arguments very substantially. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Marumo, uh, one of the things that came out of uh, both Brazil and our work uh, in South Africa, but especially the work that Marcela presented that she and uh, our colleague uh, Gabriela Chavez have been doing in Brazil, is that um, in a somewhat perverse way, uh, there is a, uh, an especially strong opportunity to assert uh, flexibility in uh, patent systems, uh, uh, a contextualization and rationalization of a system uh, around patents to make it work for the country that the legislation is in, when there is a big, well-functioning public health system that spends a lot of money on patented medicines. Mm. Uh, and I think that, uh, uh, and I say it's a perverse uh, 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 opportunity, partly because the argument for access to medicines should be just as strong as to whether uh, there is an individual buying it at a shop or it is an individual getting it for free through uh, the state-funded uh, health system. Mm. But when it is state money that is being spent, and when it is state money that therefore could be saved or extended to treat 10 and 20 times the number of people with the same amount of money, that does seem to us, at least from where we sit, as presenting a, a special opportunity for the same state, another division of the same state, mm. to uh, think about the patent system differently on the basis that uh, it affects the finances uh, and the functioning of the state at large. Uh, how have those conversations uh, developed in South Africa and where do you see the opportunity uh, for the health system and the Department of Health and their concerns uh, impacting the way that uh, this process uh, turns out? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Achal, for the question. Um, you know, one of the... Um, important recommendations of the UN uh, high-level panel uh, in 2016 was that governments should have strengthened intra-governmental uh, coordination. Um, and uh, we certainly have taken that seriously. So the uh, concerns of all of our uh, partner ministries feature very prominently uh, in our thinking about how we uh, look at uh, IP issues. So for instance, the Department of Health is a very, very key stakeholder uh, and a key partner, not, not even stakeholder, a key partner. Uh, in how we um, uh, have been, you know, conducting the reforms, um, and so you know, you know, certainly the considerations are always, uh, you know, f you know, at the forefront of our of our thinking. Um, specifically, uh, when it comes to how that uh, department has, uh, you know, utilized flexibilities, etc. You know, and here um, I'm going to be fair to um, corporate. Uh, you know, to the corporate entities. I think that, you know, um, you will be aware of the history that we've had in South Africa about how um, there's been contestation in the past with, uh, um, you know, certain multinational corporations uh, when South Africa had um, tried to introduce legislation that sought to facilitate uh, better access. But I would say that, uh, you know, that particular, the way that was resolved and, and you know, through uh, the support and partnership of civil society in the United States, um, and in South Africa, um, a, a new dynamic uh, has emerged, you know, between the uh, Department of Health and um, corporate uh, entities. Uh, there's really um, very significant cooperation that does happen. Um, the negotiations that happen when it comes to pricing, etc. Um, you know, the the, the 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 Department of Health is able to negotiate, you know, prices uh, for products that are favorably comparable, even with India. Uh, with you know the brand pharmaceutical uh, entity, so that that certainly uh, is is the reality. 
and, and, and you know, voluntary mechanisms have been very, very useful. Having said that, of course, it's important that from a sustainability perspective, you can't run your health system based on largesse. Uh, so, of course, uh, we do have um, ambitions, and we're working on this to ensure that our legislation uh, allows a sustainable way of ensuring um, uh, you know, uh, access to affordable drugs, uh, both for the public and the private sector. And indeed, um, you know, I think that process has been, has been appreciated. Thank you very much, Marumo. And thank you, Marumo and Amy, for joining us. We're honored to have you. Uh, that brings us to the end of our discussion. And so now we can open it up and have a broader discussion. I hope you have questions. Uh, if you have a question, uh, when you ask it, would you introduce yourself so that uh, people here know who you are? And if you have a uh, question for a specific person, then name the person um, so that it's easier to answer. Maybe we can collect uh, three or four questions and start with Brooke. Um, go ahead. Is there a mic? Oh, yeah, there it is. I'm not sure. Can you turn it on, perhaps? <laughs> oh, yes, it does. It works. Good. <laughs> okay, so um, my question was uh, really about the experience in, in Brazil and the problem of pending patents and the effect that has on the willingness of generics to even risk coming into the market during the pendency period. This isn't a problem just in Brazil, but it's an extreme problem in Brazil, as you described, particularly since the examination period can take over 10 years or 12 or 14 years. Pharma always complains about this. Our patents aren't being granted quickly enough. USTR complains about it. But in fact, those pending patents are very effective in preventing generic entry. Um, and the, a solution might be that we simply try to speed up the examination system, but we know speeding examination risks lower quality, which is a bit of a problem. And on some medicines, uh, the, the medicine comes to market well before the examination is undertaken. And so we know there's an important product that is essentially has exclusivity because of the dependency. And we haven't really, I think, as a community, address very concretely, well, what do we want to do about that? What, you know, I mean, there, there have been some proposals, for example, or some tension between proposals about time for oppositions and opposition mechanisms to make sure that unworthy uh, patents have been weeded out. There are other discussions about whether there should be voluntary licenses on pending, uh, pending patents, and certainly whether there can be compulsory licensing. All of it complicated as well with a statute like Brazil's, which allows retrospective damages for coming into the market during the pendency period. So I wonder if the uh, panelists have any thoughts on, you know, a, the, the variety and maybe best approaches to deal with the pendency problem, because I do think it's a problem in virtually any jurisdiction. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, shall we take one or two other questions and then, um, uh, Brooke, could you pass on that mic? Uh, uh, Jamie, I don't, Judith, I don't see you. Uh, Suri. I'll take it up. Go ahead. Sir. Thank you. Um, Suri Moon with the Graduate Institute in Geneva. I also wanted to echo the congratulations on the um, really excellent and exciting work that was presented. I had a question for Professor Ali. Um, the, the findings that you presented, I think, were very uh, hard-hitting. And I'm wondering if you could speak about a couple of things. One, what was the public reaction uh, to the findings when you released them? What was the impact on sort of the policy debate? And my second question is much more specific. I was struck by, um, I'm not sure if I understood you correctly, but I was struck by the fact that the examination guidelines didn't accurately reflect the Novartis standard, if I understood you correctly. And I, would run, I was wondering if you would explain to us in a little bit more detail how did it not reflect that standard, and, and why did it not reflect that standard? Go ahead, Jim. Um, I think that the presentations and some of the comments from people uh, uh, illustrate some of the challenges in regulating um, the system of granting patents on, on medical uh, technologies. Um, and uh, you know, in, in some cases, even when there's good laws on the books and not necessarily follow through and things like that. 
I, I've worked on these issues for a long time, and I've, I've come to the conclusion that the regulation of the monopoly uh, is not working very well, and that people should consider uh, a different business model for uh, in, uh, funding research and development that doesn't start with the idea that you give somebody a legal monopoly and then you try and claw back from that uh, uh, exceptions and limitations. Uh, and that whole delinkage paradigm, I have just wanted to know what the panel members uh, thought about whether the focus should be on, we have to do the the current reforms because that's people live and die right now and the other things take take a while, but, but whether or not there should be uh, how much attention should be given to the more fundamental and transformative reforms that can't be done in the short run, but may but may actually resolve the the access issues in a more fundamental way. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, it was Judith, Louis. Oh, sorry. And okay, and Gopa. Hi. Um, this is Judith Lewis from UNDP. Also thanking all the panelists, but also Achal for coordinating this work. Um, I think um, it's basically a testimony that the data and the knowledge of access to medicines are really in the global south, and that there is a lot that the world needs to learn from the work that's been done for many years. Um, so thank you for putting this data together and this panel together. I guess my question is a little bit linked to what Jamie was saying. Um, there are conversations right now at a global level about new models for innovation. I'm just back from New York where there was a quite high level discussion about um, the research and development hub that uh, is gonna be launched or has been launched by the G20 where the three countries are part of, as well as there was a very important um, panel organized by the government of South Africa on the framework for research and development collaboration among the BRICS countries. Um, in these discussions, there was a lot of um, suggestions about the need for BRICS to invest on in research and development, both for antimicrobial resistance as well as for tuberculosis. Um, there were very little discussions about the norms and the principles that have been agreed at an international level and how we're going to ensure a public return on that public investment. So I was wondering how government, civil society, how the data that exists in the BRICS and the expertise that exists in the BRICS, how we can incorporate that in the discussions about how these incentives uh, and these research and development plans are being designed and how we bring that multi-stakeholder and that multi-sectorial um, engagement that has happened in South Africa during the reform of the Patent Act into also discussion about how these incentives and these fundings are being designed. Thank you very much. I'm going to suggest that we answer these initial set of questions and then we'll get back to Luis Gopa and yourself. Is that fine? Um, Marcela, would you like to start with the Brooks question on the pending patents in Brazil? Just press that to speak. Okay, so thanks, Brooke, for your question. Uh, yes, that was the main reason why we decided to do this research, even if in the when we were doing it, we also came up with other reasons. The pending patent uh, problem was the what motivated us to, to, to actually look at what was going on. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a huge waiting time of 13 years uh, in the pharmaceutical sector between the filing date and the, the date of a decision. And uh, we've been saying for many years that, in fact, there is a de facto monopoly during all this time because the pharmaceutical companies and even uh, public uh, production in Brazil doesn't really go in the market during all this time. Uh, we've been saying it for a long time, but we never really uh, went much to try to understand what are the factors that uh, make this happen. So in this study, we try to analyze a little bit more the legislation about the uh, compensation that has to be given by if the patent gets uh, granted um, later. Uh, we did a little launching of the study in Rio in July, and uh, we got some feedback saying that actually that's not very relevant, even if it was the main point that we, that we analyzed from a legal perspective, that was something that seems that it was going to be dissuasive for any competitors. But the feedback that we got is that that was not 
very relevant. So we still have to understand actually what is that uh, moves the, the companies not to register during this time. And we didn't have enough time to actually go more, talk to the producers and try to actually uh, see what's keeping them back. So that's one of the points that we still have to do a little bit more uh, research on. From my perspective, I still think that it's uh, very relevant and we are one of the, com of the recommendations is to change the law in this in this in this aspect and to uh, grant less uh, rights for the patent holders when they are not holders yet in the time that's spending because legally they can uh, go into the market so there are some uh, safeguards but there could be more in comparison to what trip says and what uh, other law says so this is one component that we are going to try to add to the patent law reform, but as you know also, <laughs> we've been in a process of patent law reform for ages in Brazil and not really changes. So we also try to see what are the things that we can do now. And then unfortunately, there has not been much cases, uh, legal cases, where we can actually see how these uh, would be implemented by a court. So we don't have much jurisprudence, but we try to come up with a knowledge of if there is a case, how public interest can be, uh, has to be taken more into consideration uh, regarding private uh, interest, especially when production is done by the uh, public uh, manufacturers and to be used in the public health system, because in Brazil that's the case, most of the, of the, of the cases that we, that we that we work with are cases that are going to be destroyed by, by, by free at the, at the public health system. So now we actually, many people are following the Sophos Bovi case, other people are not, but there, there is a discussion going on in the judiciary about that because the patent was granted and then it was annulled by a court and then one of the things that they say was how public interest had to be on top of, uh, of private uh, interest and how but it goes much beyond, but one of the things that they say is how the patent office have to try to take into consideration more public interest aspects when they are actually analyzing the patents, and that can actually be one thing that actually changes the way that the patents are analyzed in Brazil. Talking about, I mean, what can we do to actually try to speed up system, uh, the analysis in a way that doesn't go to the solution that the patent office is now putting forward, which is the automatic granting of patents. We absolutely don't want to go in that direction. And then the example of South Africa that's actually trying to move away from that system where they don't analyze patents. And we are seeing Brazil going to that direction. So there's lots of going on and there's lots of things that can be done. And we can talk about more data later because we don't really have much time to go into details. In summary, as Thanks. I'm, I'm reminded <laughs> and, and scolded with every five minutes, Brazil is complex and no one understands. <laughs> Just joke. It's not, uh, it, but it is complex. Uh, uh, Firuz, would you like to take um, Suri's question uh, around this? I'll go back to my presentation here so that I can, I didn't have the time to go through the no other standard. It's, uh, See, uh, first let me answer what has been the public response to this. Um, it's hard to expect the patent office to own up its mistakes, and especially when we have a system of appeals. I mean, whenever you point out to a bad patent, the immediate response or the official response is that, oh, we have an appellate system, take it on appeal, we'll knock it off, or we'll look into it in greater detail. So that should be the standard response if you have to ask there's a very high error rate, and I'm sure there's no patent office on earth which operates without an error rate. So it's a matter that we just found the error rate in a particular class of uh, patents to say that this is the error rate. So the official response that we would expect from them is that take it up in appeal or file a review process if it is still open, because you can still file a post-grant review if it's been one year since the grant, but that's not possible. Or you will have to take it up in some other manner, say a public interest litigation or something else, but the response is going to be that there will be mistakes. It's for people who are uh, aggrieved to correct it. Why didn't the examination guidelines detail the NOATA standard? Mm. Uh, what had happened, if you can look at the guidelines, which was updated in 2013, I guess, soon after the case, or 2014, it took them so much time to update the guidelines they merely produced paragraphs of the judgment, which I feel it simply doesn't help. Because you have this 100 page long decision given by the highest court, and who has to apply this? There are examiners and controllers who have no background in law. 
So there is one more step that they should have ideally done is to digest the findings of the judgment, which is what we did in our report, and to say that this is the standard. Now apply this. That's not there. Mere reproduction of certain paragraphs from the judgment would not amount to, and that's our finding, to say that just by merely copying and pasting some paragraphs, it's not going to help us to understand what the court actually said. Mm -hmm. Now let's just let me just take you take a minute to say what were the seven things. They are not actually steps in sequence, they are things that you should look at if you're dealing with new forms of known substances. First, identify the new form of the known substance and its pharmacological properties such as efficacy. That's one thing. We found that in the 50 cases that we did, not all these seven steps were followed. Two, compare the pharmacological properties of the known substance with the new form of the known substance, and this requires some data, which you'll see soon. Provide comparative material, and this, this enhances the disclosure standard in every pattern. And if you know that, as I said, the traditional approach is to file something in Europe or in the US and just pass on the same PCT application without any amendment and pass it on. That simply will not work, but you know, you would find that applicants come up with some novel way to get over these objections. So the comparative material has to be there as a part of the specification. Then exclude physical chemical properties like more beneficial flow properties, better thermodynamic stability, low hygroscopicity. These are the findings of the Supreme Court. I mean, you will not find this extracted in a usable way in the guidelines. Then in the case of medicines, the test of efficacy can only be therapeutic efficacy. And the, the, the applicant has to specifically claim, this is another thing, you can't just mention something about efficacy somebody in some part of your application. There has to be a specific claim for the Indian Patent Office to grant it. And finally, uh, to show that the enhanced efficacy should be proved in addition to your inventive step requirement, because it's not an alternative. You have to show that the test of patentability, that it's novel, it has an inventive step, and it's capable of industrial application, should be done in addition and not either or. And you'll find that in many cases, I mean, of the 50 samples that we had, the applicant will just say that, oh, it's not obvious, it's inventive, so grant me. And they got them granted. Wow. So these seven steps, as, in, as the way in which we have extracted in our report, does not find any mention in the examination guidelines. And, and I would say that it was lost in translation because the intended argued audience of the guideline are the controllers and the examiners. And unless you're going to take the decision and make it into a easily digestible form, uh, this, things like this can happen. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Vivas. Um, uh, Jimmy, in response to your question, uh, I think that we struggle, we, we support and admire the efforts that you make and many others do on new R&D models and new business models uh, for creation of uh, new pharmaceuticals. Uh, uh, the idea of delinkage, uh, we support and admire all of it. I think that uh, our energies have been focused on addressing the immediate problem, as you say. Uh, but I struggle with that in the sense of how to uh, be able to do, to do more than this at the same time. And uh, Amy, do you have any thoughts on, you know, some of that, how do you combine, you know, looking at, at, at the harder work that is the, the, the slow slog for a, a completely different future, um, in, which is quite distant uh, in comparison to spending time working on the system that we have now? Um, I'm not sure I have any, <laughs> any, any, any brilliant ideas. I mean, I do think it's worth thinking about, for example, as legislative proposals are being put forth, to attend to whether or not there are aspects about R and D that could be incorporated, um, and um, you know, it's it, one of the things that's been interesting to me about the U.S. proposals, and I've been talking to people and um, on the Hill who are from various senators' offices and things, putting together proposals, is that some of them do actually combine, um, say, various means to reduce prices with R and D proposals, and and sometimes it's you know if we can reduce prices by fining companies for excessive prices or taxing them, then some of that money will go back into research or, um, or in fact, creating special research funds. And obviously, this has some benefits with respect to the political appeal of we want to reduce drug prices but not harm R&D. But it also, so maybe there are ways in which um, those who are working on legislative reforms could start to try to incorporate uh, some provisions about R&D into those same bills. In fact, it can be complicated, of course, given different committees and so forth that that might trigger um, in each national setting. But so this, this may be one thing to think about that I've been impressed by in the U.S. process. Um, and of course, sort of how you allocate your energies, it seems right that, that 
that we all have to be thinking about the longer term with and and uh, and wh whether or not the work that we're doing, even some of it, of course, that's focused on the short term, can be beneficial in terms of the longer term. Absolutely, um, uh, Marumo, would you have uh, uh, some thoughts on Judith's question, which was how uh, the BRICS process, which you are closely involved with, mm. uh, might inform these new business models or new approaches to R and D? Uh, as well as how that works in terms of uh, some of the cooperation on intellectual property as it exists. Yeah, I mean, uh, th oh. <coughs> thanks, uh, Achal, for the question, and thanks, Judith, uh, for the question. So the BRICS cooperation that we have on, on IP, you know, it tends to be very practical. Um, and, uh, you know, I, th I suppose somewhat linked over to also to the previous question on, on the linkage and some of these other models is that, uh, I mean, Yes, there's a lot of discussion uh, internationally. There's a lot of, I mean, I see some people in the room have written a lot on this, like Professor Moon and others. But at a, at a, at a tangible, uh, implementable level, um, we, it's still not a very mature um, discussion to, to, to be able to implement uh, through um, domestic uh, legislation as far as, as, far as we've, we've observed. So as I say, the cooperation at BRICS has tended to be at a very, very practical level. Uh, an implementation type uh, level, um, not so much at a, at a, at a conceptual level. So, so um, I suppose that is something that we we could look at. Maybe we could organize a, a BRICS conference on on, on 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 some of these issues. But uh, at a day to day level, it's more of an implementation and practical uh, level on as far as IP um, and, and the likes are concerned. Thank you, Barumo. We have 10 minutes left, and so we'll take one other big round of questions. I know that Luis had his hand up, uh, Gopa had his hand up, and there are two, yeah, Anthony and you. Oh, and, and Matt as well. Fine. So let's start there. And We can't hear you. Just switch it on. My name is Paul Ogendi. I understand the need for patent reforms, which is very important. And I'm asking this question because BRICS represent the leadership in developing countries and they should guide others. Uh, I'm more concerned about preserving the policy space and trade agreements or anti-counterfeiting act come into mind. So one of the things that I've been thinking about is impact assessment, or human rights impact assessment to be specific as a tool for developing countries to employ so that the policy space even as you expand patent reforms and provide for flexibilities that you do not undermine uh, that effort. And specifically to Marumo, I have not seen government enthusiasm in this front. What, what could be the reason why um, the governments are not interested even many years? And I think the report uh, in 2016 indicated the need for public health impact assessment. But for countries with the right to health, you can argue for right to health impact assessment. And for the other countries in Brazil and other areas, what should be done so that uh, this methodology is taken up uh, seriously because you cannot just focus on patent reforms without paying attention to the other threats, particularly in relation to trade agreements. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll just go in order of who's closest to the mic. So Anthony, would you like to go next? Um, I'm Anthony So with the um, ID Initiative for the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, I had first my compliments to the panel for really a great, um, excellent and great work across the board. I had two quest quick questions. One's for Feroz. Um, well, I'd be comfortable that the Indian Patent Office were to copy and paste your seven criteria uh, to embrace the Novartis standard. I wonder, should we really leave the checklist approach to a process that develops such guiding criteria largely internal to patent offices? Um, is that really a sure enough path to ensuring that we have the right precedent adopted by the patent office? Or do we need to have a different kind of process that we need to give more thought to as to how they arrive at the checklist? Um, and the second policy um, tool that I'd be really interested in hearing about, perhaps directed to the larger panel. Some years ago, the WHO and Health Action International created the Medicines Prices Project and a, and a standardized instrument for unpacking price components of essential drugs. And that went on to be very widely used, I believe in over 100 countries. So my question is, do we need today a more standard cross-national economic valuation approach for measuring the potential benefit from the cost savings realized from actually, for example, 
moving to generic alternatives that might be placed onto marketplaces. Because again, I don't know the methodology as you folks, particularly in Brazil and elsewhere, are applying it. Do we have a standardized methodology and should we actually move towards one? Thank you, Anthony. Uh, going this way, is it Gopa? Is there anyone between Gopa and Anthony? No. Two quick questions. One, um, um, Feroz and uh, of course Atal, uh, while uh, doing this report, what are the factors which really uh, led to this kind of situation? So I think Section 3D is pretty clear. And if you read, uh, all non-experts also understand that how to go about it, then why the patent office really made this huge mistake? What are the factors? Is it political? Or is it, uh, the, are there any other factors like people always cite uh, wrong technical assistance uh, or the training, uh, you know, evangelization of IP uh, through some external actors? What are those factors, whether you had any uh, uh, reflection while preparing this report? And second, uh, on this Novartis test, <coughs> I think if you read, uh, I mean, again, it's section 3D is very clear and how to go about it. And there was no need of any test actually in a way. And uh, 2007, we have the judgment from the, uh, uh, from the uh, Chennai Madras High Court. Uh, so uh, when we say in a way there is a Novartis test in 2013, in a way we are pushing the, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the clarification period another six more years. Actually, 2007, in a way, everything is clarified after the implement, you know, we have the amend act was amended in 2005, and within two years, uh, 2007, uh, I think August, uh, the, the clarification cr came from the uh, Madras High Court. Uh, then, in a way, I'm saying that if you say no what is uh, test from the Supreme Court means, in a way, we are pushing it for six more years, uh, saying that uh, giving a benefit of doubt to the patent office. I think uh, that is in a way unfair. Thank you. Thank you, Gopal. Uh, Luis, and then Matt, is that correct? Yeah. Or is there anyone else? Okay. So, okay. Uh, well, thank you. I have a, a, just a, a, a practical question. In, in the case of Brazil, that y y you mentioned that the, there were a number of drugs uh, that they were you know, being bought for an exclusive you know, provider, and those were with no patent, if I, I understood correctly. And uh, if that the case uh, in Brazil, have they thought, uh, or, or, or you know, uh, countries who have th are thinking on using the, the compulsory licensing for you know import from a different country? You no, know, so so to ask, you know, like, like a compulsory licensing for export in Canada to to, to import to Brazil, where it's not a patent, uh, is do you see that feasible? Thank you, and Matt. Hey, Matt Cavanaugh from Georgetown. So building a bit off um, Maruma's comment, I, I wonder if I could ask you guys to, to push a little bit on the, on the politics here. It, it is, um, this work is fantastic and really interesting and it really advances us um, along the way and gives us something else to push on. And I see some pieces that are very country specific, right? Things that are different country to country about what you found. And then of course, some clear threads. So my question is, do you see a political venue in which this could actually be addressed? Um, is it, you know, there is, you know, we have WTO, we have WIPO, we have UNDP, we have, um, we have uh, WHO. Is there a political venue in which this, this level of failure that you're documenting here could actually be addressed or not? And if not, then that's a bit of an indictment about where we stand right now and do we need to do some political thinking about how to create such a venue, whether that's a BRICS venue or not. Um, where these could be addressed not just as a one-off, because the point of that Maruma makes about like one-off efforts really expose um, every everybody that's trying to do this to huge political push that we don't always win at, right? So is there a way to move forward? Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Matt, uh, uh, just in relation to your question, uh, I'll, I'll ask, let Marumo uh, talk more about it, but simply because you brought it up last and it's on my mind, um, I just want to say that one of the, the ways in which uh, the work that we've done in India goes is that uh, we have uh, work on small molecules out and we'll have work on biologics out. Mm -hmm. uh, our findings in summary are that the Indian Patent Office works with a rejection rate of roughly 40% when it comes to pharma patents. Uh, our conclusions are that it should work with a rejection rate of 90%. Uh, 
Uh, that's astounding. Um, and honestly, I don't think that w even when the United States and the EU complained about Indian patent law in 2005, they did not imagine that what we were thinking of is a patent system that can legitimately, with total compliance at the WTO, exclude 90% of the world's pharmaceutical patents. I really don't think it's what they had in mind. So I think it is a big fight, but at the same time, it's a just fight. Uh, this is very, very rational. I think our struggle in India is to make sure that the Indian system can work as it should. Um, but I do think that what it provides is if, if that can happen, and we've had initial conversations with the patent office and so on, uh, it does provide a very attractive picture of a workable system for a third world country, uh, for another country to consider adopting. Um, in terms of political possibilities, uh, Marumo, do you want to say something about um, uh, Matt's question in terms of where you think some of these uh, ideas can go? Let me reflect and then, uh, and then I'll, 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 I'll come back at the end. Absolutely. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the first question that came from Paul, is it correct? On human rights impact assessments, I think that your question was primarily towards Marumo. I think Andrew has a few things that he'd like to say about how uh, the implementation of treaties uh, can be informed by human rights impact assessments. Um, which... Uh, uh, which is coordinated, it's known as Ask Justice, it's coordinated by the University of Cape Town's uh, intellectual property um, unit, uh, Tobias Convieto, who's sitting on the table just in front of you, um, this way, is, uh, is the, um, my, my fellow um, uh, leader of that project. So we didn't look directly at human rights impact assessments of uh, tr treaties, we looked at human rights impact assessments of legislation in four African countries. Um, and um, we, we try to see if countries were carrying them out. In some cases, they did carry out human rights impact assessments. In some cases, they didn't. We did look at the treaties that were already binding people, not FTAs, so not bilaterals, but um, the existing human rights instruments, and of course, Bern, Paris, TRIPS, the WCT in some cases. So I would say a number of things. Governments aren't unities. So there are competing interests within governments and trade is driven by the people whose job is to do trade and they do trade offs and then they they need to engage and i this may be absolutely necessary as a political necessity um to engage in some kinds of trade offs so i think that a a, a lack of enthusiasm for human rights assessments is uh, due to the way that would constrain negotiations publicly. If you're going into negotiation and it might be helpful to have a human rights assessment saying you can't do X, but then if you, what if you give away X in exchange for getting Y? That's going to be politically difficult. So, so that's a kind of a real politic reading of that. But there's actually another danger. And, and yeah, there's another danger, which I discovered uh, there's an unaccountable enthusiasm um, in a number of um, quarters in, in Africa for claiming that the human right that you should really be protecting is a human right to IP. Now, I don't believe there's a basis for claiming in uh, any of this country we studied or in international law that IP is a human right. But that seemed to be the first human right that people wanted to, to find. And... So I'm, I'd be a bit of afraid of a human rights assessment because there'd be a claim that, that more IP should result uh, as a consequence. Marumo, as someone who, who does employ human rights impact assessments, uh, would you like to address that question quickly? I'll be very brief. I'm cognizant of time. Yeah. So the first thing, you, you, you asked two things. One was about the preservation of policy space, uh, and then the other one was human rights impact assessment. So policy space, I mean, the South African government is very clear about the preservation of policy space. Um, and if you look at our engagements in various international fora, uh, it's, it's, you know, it, it's quite evident. I mean, uh, some of you were at the uh, high-level uh, declaration on TB last week. We, we, we work a lot on this. Uh, and uh, just uh, one example, for example, domestically, if you look at our approach to bilateral investment treaties, um, that, that I think has been quite a leader. One of the main considerations was the preservation uh, of policy space. And then on human rights impact assessments, actually, um, I'm not sure what happens in other governments, but certainly we are very, very uh, open to them. In fact, um, we conducted a human rights impact assessment uh, in relation to our uh, IP policy that we um, have uh, you know, recently concluded. 
Um, it's not yet in the public domain, but we work very closely with the United Nations Development Program and other uh, intergovernmental organizations so that we, we do see that as a very important uh, facet of our policy work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Firuz, would you like to address Anthony's questions, which are around how, uh, what kind of process might help the patent office arrive at a better checklist? Yeah, um, I, I can club both uh, Pro, uh, Dr. Su and Gopal because there's an overlap there. Great. Uh, he had suggested that there could be an anti-evergreening checklist, and we also have included the draft. Is your mic working? Is it on? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, uh, we had suggested a checklist on, on what are the things that the patent office can do, and this should be a part of the FER itself. But what we noted was, and this partly answers what Gopa had raised, we had noticed that though the patent office had raised these objections, a 3D or a 3E objection, at the FER stage, the first examination report stage, the applicant would eventually overcome them. And we identified seven categories where they overcome an objection by saying, hey, this is not 3D stuff, this is actually 3E, and I have synergy to show. Or they will carry out an amendment. So why the protection has not actually translated into actual protection in the ground is because of the way in which the patent office works. And it gives you enormous amount of time and opportunities to amend and to narrow down your claim. So if you see that we had seven categories on the ways in which applicants normally get over a 3D objection. Uh, a more detailed guideline, I feel, should be the way forward because the guidelines are not just for the examiners and the controllers, it's for the applicants as well and for people to look at what should be the reasoning of the patent office when it grants a patent. Now, just to come back to Gopas' thing on, we had a 2006 uh, Madras High Court decision, then why did we have to wait till 2013? Uh, the simple answer is that the patent office guidelines were not amended after the Madras High Court decision, it was after the Supreme Court decision. So the law, I mean, and what the Supreme Court declares as per our Indian constitution, it becomes a part of the law of the land. Great. Uh, uh, Anthony had another question which was around a, um, uh, uh, comparisons, uh, economic comparisons that we could make around price components of drugs. Uh, and, and I think what you noted is that given the different contexts in which we're working, how is that feasible and applicable? Um, one, uh, there might be someone else who wants to add to that, but uh, I, I can, I can uh, provide some uh, understanding into how we thought of it. The, the, firstly, price data, historical price data we found is uh, rather difficult to get when you don't have a large commercial institutional subscription to IMS Health, which is the worldwide monopoly on uh, drug prices now and past. Uh, but Regardless of that, of course, there are several price comparisons that we can make from any country. We found that there are contextual factors that make some of these price comparisons weak uh, or ineffective, in, in a sense, uh, irrelevant. Uh, for instance, Brazil. Uh, now, there are numerous price comparisons that we can run. Uh, uh, there are a few problems with that. One, the Brazilian government, when it negotiates prices, actually negotiates prices, and those are pretty good. So they're quite far away from what the retail price is, even in Brazil. Uh, two. Uh, the Brazilian medicines registration system has historically been both complex and closed. And what it means is that in the absence of uh, numerous intellectual property barriers, you can still have a registration barrier where the drug simply isn't available. There are provisions in Brazil to be able to buy through a shared system uh, from PAHO, um, uh, which doesn't require a local registration prior to deployment in Brazil. Those have recently been over overruled. Which uh, working on different ways in which some of those provisions can be brought back. Um, uh, so the, the, this combination, South Africa has a uh, notoriously difficult registration process that can take up to three years. So uh, I think that the price comparisons are always very helpful. Uh, uh, they could be improved and I, I think we could use standardized methodology. It doesn't always help us uh, in terms of uh, explicating the current situation because of uh, numerous interlayered barriers. Uh, that make them sometimes uh, irrelevant. Um, did you want to add? Did you want to add to that, or Firoz? Did you want to add to uh, the uh, uh, Gopas question of why or what the factors uh, the w would have been for the bad assessment of pharma patents? Uh, could it be uh, political? Could it be just technical incompetence or complexity of the laws? Uh, I, Very quickly, I, sorry, because I, we're out yeah, of time. As I observed the applicant gets a better chance with the patent office to explain and to make either 
uh, submissions. And we also find a difference in the understanding of certain legal provisions. You have orders where they take purely technical legal arguments, which we would find that controllers who are not normally legally trained to, uh, to, to, to even defend them or to give a written opinion on that. So there is some amount of training that is required as to how the controllers should write their orders where they either grant or reject patents. And we find that uh, the training part, you know, though as, as has been said, that there are quite a lot of stakeholders who are interested in training the people at the patent office. Uh, what is more important is an order that is passed by a controller is potential matter that can be agitated before the Supreme Court. In fact, the Supreme Court judges here have said that if a patent is valid because it's we hold it to be valid. So the ultimate arbiter of a patent case is the Supreme Court. So there should be some training, in my opinion, which goes to help the controllers write better orders that can stand judicial scrutiny. Thank you, Firoz. Final answer, Marcella, from uh, Luis's question about uh, uh, what, what tactics you can use in Brazil to uh, when you have monopoly uh, supply, even though uh, there is no patent, whether you can have compulsory licensing from import from a different country. I didn't really, I don't know if I understood your question, Luis. Maybe if I reply wrong, we, we can talk afterwards. <laughs> Because what uh, what we studied are the situations where there is no patent uh, in Brazil, but uh, there is still only one supplier. And then I understood you saying that uh, how Brazil could issue a compulsory license to export to another country. But there is no patent barrier in that situation. Why would they have to issue a compulsory license? No, most of these most of these medicines that we that we looked at first, I, I think that specific situation that you're talking about is for very specific for countries without manufacturing capacity. So I don't really think that Brazil would uh, classify using the that specific provision. But also, lots of them there is already generics being produced in other places. There is no patent bar here in Brazil. There are other situations that there are other factors that are playing there. That's not I issue. I, I don't really get how the compulsory license could be uh, useful in this situation. I mean, for me, the compulsory license is useful for the ones that we have, that the patents have been granted, which are little, but they are some. Uh, but maybe we can exchange more after we have yes, another panel. Maybe we, we can talk about time. this after the panel. Yeah, so I can better understand. Uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Firoz, Andrew, Marcella, for your work. Thank you, Marumo and Amy, for joining us. Thank you for being here. We really enjoyed this discussion and uh, all of us will be around if you'd like to talk further. Thanks. Bye.